Okay, thanks again for the introduction. Um, what I'm going to present is some basic information about heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy. And I've intentionally kept it fairly basic, but I am happy to answer any more questions uh, and delve into specifics when we're all done. So I've entitled the talk, Heated Intraperitoneal Chemotherapy, What, When, Who, Why, and Where, because I think that nicely summarizes each aspect of the procedure and it, it addresses the most common questions that I get about this. So to start off with, what is HIPEC? I'm going to go through each of these in more detail on separate slides. HIPEC is an operation which combines tumor removal surgery with an intra-abdominal heated chemotherapy regimen. When is it performed? It's performed when cancer has spread to the abdominal lining. Who is it for? HIPEC is for patients whose tumors are surgically resectable and are limited to the abdominal cavity. Why do we do HIPEC? We know through very solid data that it improves outcomes in well-selected patients. And where is HIPEC performed? It's performed at centers with experience in HIPEC, and I'll talk more about this as we get going. So now taking those questions individually, again, what is HIPEC? HIPEC actually stands for something much longer. It's cytoreductive surgery with heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy. So even though we say just HIPEC, that first portion of it, the cytoreductive surgery, is a really important component of HIPEC. Uh, just the chemotherapy itself uh, does not uh, adequately describe what we mean when we say HIPEC. What does that first part mean? What is cytoreductive surgery? Cytoreductive surgery means that the surgeon removes all visible cancer deposits in the abdomen. Now this may involve removing uh, certain organs if the tumor is uh, very intimately involved with those structures. So that might be a bowel resection. It might involve a uh, maybe a splenectomy uh, or um, ophorectomy if needed to eliminate all sites of tumor. I'm going to discuss a little bit later on how the involvement of other organs really determines whether someone is a candidate for HIPEC. There are obviously uh, certain organs that are vital and uh, cannot be removed. And so when we assess a patient to see if whether they're a candidate for HIPEC, we need to assess whether there's any tumor involvement in what we sometimes call deal breaker areas. And I'm going to talk more about that on some, uh, some of my next slides. The second part of HIPEC, the heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy, refers to the way that we deliver chemotherapy in HIPEC. So when most people think about chemotherapy, they think about the intravenous route uh, that we typically see uh, delivered to patients. But HIPEC uses intraperitoneal chemotherapy, so that means the chemotherapy is delivered directly into the abdominal cavity. So the abdomen and the tumor that's in the abdomen uh, is lavaged with this chemotherapy solution. Uh, there's a few reasons for this. One is that this allows direct drug tumor contact, so we actually have the tumor cells directly in contact with the chemotherapeutic agent. Um, the abdominal lining actually serves as a, as a uh, barrier to absorption into the bloodstream. So since the uh, chemotherapy drug is only uh, given to the abdominal cavity, we can use much higher concentrations than we would able to be able to, be, uh, uh, to deliver intravenously because uh, the blood concentration of the chemotherapy agent stays quite low when we're doing HIPEC therapy. So, for example, the, the drug that we typically use is an agent called mitomycin C, and when this agent is given intravenously, it has to be given at pretty low doses, otherwise patients can experience cardiac toxicities. But we never see those toxicities when we use mitomycin C in HIPEC, specifically because those high concentrations are only seen by the tumor in the abdominal cavity, and it's not... Uh, it doesn't diffuse into the bloodstream, and so the rest of uh, the patient, uh, including their heart and their other organs, uh, don't see these high concentrations of drugs. The reason that we use heat when we do HIPEC, that's what the H stands for, is again for a couple of reasons. Uh, normal cells are very robust, and when you have changes in temperature, your normal body cells are able to respond to those changes, and they can recuperate once the temperature returns to normal. 
tumor cells, precisely because they're abnormal, they've lost some of their coping mechanisms. And so they're sensitive. Just the T alone uh, is actually damaging to tumor cells. The other benefit of heat is that heat makes the cell membrane more permeable. So it actually promotes greater entry of chemotherapy into the tumor cell. So that's another reason why we, we combine heat with the intraperitoneal chemotherapy when we do high pec. So what is it actually, what are the actual specific details of the high pec procedure? After we complete the cytoreductive surgery, so after we remove uh, all the tumor deposits and including uh, certain organs as needed to clear the abdomen of, of disease, we then connect the patient to a pump mechanism. Uh, I have a, a picture to show you. There are plastic tubes that we use to connect the patient to this pump device. And this pump circulates around the heated fluid. Uh, it's, it's sort of a lavage that uh, circulates the fluid in and out of the patient for 90 minutes. It maintains a steady temperature of about 41 to 43 degrees Celsius. And that is about the same temperature as you would have when you had a fe would have a fever. So it's not dangerous to normal cells, but again, as I mentioned, it is damaging to tumor cells. So the, the heated fluid containing the chemotherapy is circulated uh, in the abdomen for 90 minutes. And when that's complete, any remaining fluid is suctioned out and the operation is completed. Here's a picture, and what you can see here is these uh, plastic tubes coming off the patient, connecting to the HIPEC pump. This is a photo of a previous model of the pump. There's a newer uh, model that's on, on the market now that we, uh, we have two of, actually, at Mount Sinai. Um, but it still demonstrates the idea of how uh, the fluid is returned to the heating circuit pump and then delivered back into the patient. And again, this circulation continues for 90 minutes uh, while the patient is still asleep in the operating room. Okay, moving on to when. When is HIPEC used? HIPEC is appropriate when a patient has what we call carcinomatosis. Usually cancer starts in one organ and then it spreads to the rest of the body, either through the bloodstream or through the lymphatic system. So a classic example would be someone who has colon cancer and then develops a metastasis in their lung. Uh, the way it got there is that tumor cells break into the bloodstream and then travel through the bloodstream to a distant organ, in this case the lungs. But there's also a different uh, mechanism of metastasis, and that's what carcinomatosis is. In some patients, tumor cells spread from the colon, let's say if we're using colon cancer in this example, they spread from the colon cancer to the lining of the abdominal cavity. Uh, that's also called the peritoneal cavity. And so uh, these tumor deposits that then line the abdominal cavity are called carcinomatosis. HIPEC is appropriate for patients who have carcinomatosis but no other distant sites of tumor spread. So if someone has both lung metastases and carcinomatosis, HIPEC would, wouldn't be an effective treatment because it only treats the abdominal cavity. As I said before, the chemotherapy solution is delivered only to the abdominal cavity, so those lung metastases would never see the chemotherapeutic agent. And so that's why uh, we reserve HIPEC for patients who have carcinomatosis only. The other important concept about when to use HIPEC is that uh, not all tumor types spread via carcinomatosis. So some cancers uh, are uh, classically spread, as I mentioned, through distant blood-borne metastases. But there are certain cancers that classically cause carcinomatosis, and as a result, they're the ones that we most often use HIPEC for. This would include colon and rectal cancer, mucinous neoplasms of the appendix, ovarian cancer, gastric cancer, and then tumors uh, that you may not have heard of uh, that are called pseudomyxoma peritoneae and peritoneal mesothelioma. These are also tumor types where the disease is classically limited to the abdominal cavity and HIPEC could be considered. Who is a good candidate for HIPEC? As I mentioned, uh, HIPEC is not appropriate for all patients with cancer and, and not even for all patients with carcinomatosis. Really what is important about the HIPEC procedure is that good patient selection is the key to good outcomes. Cytoreduction, as I described, can mean a large operation. In fact, it could involve three or four operations at one sitting. 
Uh, and so patients really need to be healthy enough to have uh, a significant operation. Age is also a consideration, but there's no set age limit. We have done HIPEC at Mount Sinai on patients well into their 80s. As we all know, there's uh, all different kinds of 80-year-olds, and so it's something that we do take into consideration. Uh, but I would say, aside from age and general well-being, the most important way that we determine whether someone is a good candidate for HIPEC is that a complete cytoreduction must be able to be achieved. I'm going to expand on this in a little bit, but essentially what we mean is that we have to be able to remove the majority of the tumor that's present. This slide helps to describe that. If you uh, look at the size of any residual tumor deposits, in HIPEC surgery we aim to debulk or cytoreduce down to the level of CC1, meaning that we want almost no visible disease left and, and we really use two and a half millimeters as our goal. And the reason for this size cutoff is that we know that chemotherapeutic agents can dissolve into a tumor cell to a depth of a, of a couple of millimeters, but no more than that. What that means, what that implies is that if you have a large uh, tumor deposit, just putting chemotherapy on that tumor deposit is not going to be effective. That chemotherapy is not going to be able to dissolve all the way through into, let's say, a five centimeter tumor. And so the inner portion of that tumor will remain completely untreated with this procedure. And as a result, the procedure won't, really won't provide any benefit to the patient. And so we as surgeons really have to rigorously assess whether we can achieve a tumor debulking down to about two and a half millimeters. Uh, and the implication of this is that if you cannot achieve a complete site of reduction, you really shouldn't embark upon surgery. And if you've started surgery and then come to realize that it's not going to be possible, you should actually stop the procedure and close. Because as, as I said, uh, it's very important for the chemotherapy to have an effect for it to be able to dissolve and reach all the tumor cells. Here I have an example of how we assess whether people are able to be completely cytoreduced. Before surgery, we use obviously CAT scan or MRI, and uh, that can give us a pretty good idea if someone has really a lot of tumor. But CT and MRI, uh, it's, it's hard to believe, but they're actually very insensitive. And very often we find that there's tumor cells that are present uh, in some of these deal breaker areas that I mentioned that cannot be seen at all on CT or MRI. And this is something that is very important and comes into play when I'll talk at the end about where uh, you should consider having HIPEC surgery. With experience, we learn to identify uh, aspects uh, of, of disease on CT and MRI that um, maybe a radiologist or a surgeon at a center that doesn't do HIPEC would not necessarily recognize. So I have an example here of a patient on the right of the screen. This is a CAT scan, and obviously not everyone's going to be familiar with how to read a CAT scan, but you can see this sort of dark gray material um, that's present uh, throughout the abdomen that's sort of indenting the other organs and causing what we call scalloping on these organs. Uh, and this is uh, very clearly a case of a patient who unfortunately we would not be able to achieve complete cytoreduction. reduction. There's just a lot of tumor present and it would not be useful for this person to undergo a HIPEC procedure. Um, the other end of the spectrum is the patient on the left here, and what this is is a view uh, during a diagnostic laparoscopy. So we haven't actually committed to a full incision yet, um, and as is our practice, we start every surgery with a, laparosco a laparoscopy through an incision in the belly button. We insert a small camera in and we look around. And this patient does have some carcinomatosis that in this picture are these sort of whitish plaques that you can see uh, on the peritoneum. But it's a very small amount of disease. Uh, these plaques are about a centimeter in size and you can certainly picture how we'd be able to, to easily remove them uh, entirely. So again, complete cytoreduction reduction is, is really the key idea here. Uh, and there is again uh, no benefit to a partial site of reduction. So it's up to the surgeon to determine even before surgery whether or not this is going to be possible. So why do we do HIPEC? What are the goals of performing this procedure? HIPEC can actually offer a cure for certain types of cancers, uh, 
particularly low-grade cancers, and this is most classically the case in mucinous tumors of the appendix, so appendiceal cancers. While we always hope for a cure, in most cases we perform HIPEC to improve survival. Uh, it has been shown, particularly for patients with colon, rectal, and appendiceal cancer, to prolong survival. And that is, uh, those are the cancers where we have evidence from a randomized controlled trial. And that is the gold standard for, for data in the medical field. So in a randomized controlled trial, you have two groups of patients and uh, with similar backgrounds, similar types of tumors, and then they are randomized to one of two treatment arms, and then at the end, though, their outcomes are compared. So the two treatment arms in this randomized controlled trial were either the standard of care, which is IV chemotherapy alone, or in the other arm, IV chemotherapy plus a HIPEC procedure. And in this study, it was very clear that those patients who received HIPEC, in addition to IV chemotherapy, survived longer. So when we're talking about the types of cancers that were studied in this randomized controlled trial, again, those being colon cancer, rectal cancer, and appendiceal cancer, we can be very confident when, when we say that HIPEC has the potential to improve your survival. We do perform HIPEC on other cancer types, uh, and we do uh, uh, have what we would call level two data, or uh, data but not randomized controlled trial data, that HIPEC can improve survival. But we just have to keep in mind that the evidence to support HIPEC in other cancer types is much more limited. And so we have to be extra rigorous in choosing uh, patients uh, appropriately for other cancer types. And finally, where is HIPEC performed? HIPEC is ideally performed uh, at medical centers uh, who have, uh, at medical centers that have a uh, broad experience performing HIPEC. Uh, HIPEC is not available at all cancer, or at all medical centers and not even at all cancer centers. It is uh, performed really at select sites uh, across the country and it's performed by surgeons typically who focus on cancer surgery. So. Uh, you really want to have a surgeon and a surgical team that is familiar with patients who have cancer of the abdominal lining. Uh, this is really because, as I mentioned, experience in patient selection is the key to having a good outcome. And it's not just the surgeon, it's really a whole multidisciplinary team that's involved. So you need radiologists who are familiar with what carcinomatosis looks like on scans. You need medical oncologists who are familiar with uh, treating patients with carcinomatosis and in coordinating chemotherapy uh, with the surgeon and in treating patients after they've had HIPEC. And of course, you, do, you need surgeons who are technically skilled and who are familiar with the cytoreductive surgery and how to perform HIPEC. Uh, we do, at Mount Sinai, have a HIPEC center. The center, the program was started in 2007. Uh, we've performed, we just had our 200th case, uh, so we do have a sizable experience here. And at Mount Sinai, uh, we have a two-surgeon approach. So in our group of surgical oncologists, we typically have two attending surgeons involved on the operation. And that's because, as I mentioned before, HIPEC can be a lengthy operation. There is the entire cytoreductive surgery followed by an hour and a half of the chemotherapy and then the closure. And so we have found uh, that it's really advantageous for patients to have uh, uh, more than just one surgeon involved. Um, that way, you know, we're always, uh, um, you know, able to stay fresh and really remain focused throughout the entire duration of what I said can be a lengthy operation. HIPEC centers uh, are important because we really track all of our cases because we're a dedicated center. It's important to uh, review cases for quality assurance and for example at Mount Sinai we spent the last year uh, submitting all of our cases to our QA committee just to make sure that uh, uh, we had acceptable uh, levels you know of acceptably low levels of complications. And the other thing is that we keep track of all our long-term outcomes. So we participate at national conferences where we present data on long-term outcomes of our patients after HIPEC. Um, and uh, as a result, we've been invited to speak at conferences as, as invited lecturers to discuss our experience uh, in, in how HIPEC is performed. Again, how do you... Uh, how do you select proper patients and what is the appropriate follow-up for patients after they've had HIPEC?